the senator, while indoctrinated, could not explain his toxicity. You should not listen to men's rights advocates if you want to know what they have to say. Number ZZ9 plural Z alpha. Number ZZ9. I've never seen such hideous in all my life. But then it's a lot of this, eh? Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Like a furry torpedo to the jugular. This is Honey Badger Radio. Radio with money. But the senator, while indoctrinated, could not explain his toxicity. Not listen to men's rights advocates if you want to know what they have to say. Number ZZ9 plural Z alpha. Number ZZ9. There we go. For a minute, I thought that wasn't going to change for me. <laughs> Hello, and welcome to HBR Talk 283, What a Boys Need, a 1960s uh, case study has the answer. I am your host, Hannah Wallen, here with Nonsense Annihilator Lauren Brooks and the personification of perceptivity, Mike Stevenson, to finish up that video we've been examining, the 1960s case study, uh, the psychology case study or psychological study of the the aggressive little boy uh but as always we've got to do what we've got to do before we can get to that uh honey badger radio dishes out a smorgasbord of thought-provoking discussions and as experiences both recent and long past have demonstrated the provoked thoughts are fighting back 
They've made it clear that for people like us relying on third-party payment platforms like Patreon to fund our work is treading on thin ice, or building our house in the path of a rapidly growing wildfire. In light of this, we strongly encourage our supporters to switch at least their support for us to FeedTheBadger.com, the most stable way to help us out. And if you want to tip us directly instead of relying on any social media platform's tip jar, the link for that is FeedTheBadger.com slash just the tip. And as always, the same risk applies to our social media platforms, which is why you should further provoke the Thought Police by tracking our thought-provoking discussions on HoneyBadgerBrigade.com, where you can find your way to all of our content, as well as a link to FeedTheBadger.com in the drop-down menu at the top of the page. And before we drop down into this video, um, I, I think a little bit of a recap is in order because uh, it's it's been a few weeks since the last time we uh, we listened to it. So I just wanted to remind everybody as we were going through, um, there were some different things that we've noticed in uh, in in the last few sessions watching this video. And the first one being that. Somewhere along the line, we may have forgotten, but psychologists used to know, they used to understand that little boys needed to be little boys before they could be men. And and they, they needed to be loved and to know they were loved and to see adults being authentic with them in modeling, you know, adult maturity and, and the process that involves, like how you handle your emotions, how you handle your uh, interests, and uh, all of these things were being denied this child. And as a result, he, he was using tantrums and, and assaults on other people to deal with conflict and to deal with being denied things that he wanted. And so it's, it's interesting to see psychologists from the 60s approaching this problem versus the toxic masculinity narrative of today where we just hear feminists telling us well boys are boys are toxic because you know they 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 are stoic they're taught to be to to be selfish they're taught to be uh different than girls and that girls are wrong and blah 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 well that that doesn't seem to be the issue with this kid nobody has has done that with him the problem has been, obviously, a lot of it has been that uh, his mother doesn't show him a lot of affection. Um, which, I, I do look at this mom and I think maybe she is, if not, um, if not uh, uh, structurally in the brain autistic, probably socially manipulated by the, the way that her class culture is to behave like a person who is autistic, to suppress things that are normal, natural parts of human relationships, and uh, to be very um, poised and controlled, which from my upbringing is just not normal, right? Like women, women can have dignity without doing that. Um, <laughs> uh, so, uh, we, we we have a bad sad saying, I hope you don't read the chat. Well that should answer answer your question. <laughs> <laughs> um Yes we we do. I, I don't always keep up with it as well as I should. Uh but I do my best. And so it's I'm using two cons computer screens here. I'm I'm using I have a laptop and a desktop. And uh, so yeah. Then uh, Derek Workman references the song "She's as cold as ice," um, which that that's fitting. Uh, you know that that's that's actually really fitting because she does seem like yeah. a very cold, um, not just cool, calm, and collected, but cold person. And it it may be that she is suppressing a uh, more of a like hyper feminine, hysterical type personality. And that might be why she acts like this. She's gone a full 180 and then gone too far. And that's that's I've seen that historically with women. Um, and that's that's 
I don't know. I, it, it, you could say it has something to do with feminism, but it it has more to do with gynocentrism and the idea that women should have control over every social situation, whether they're they have themselves under control or not. And and to that end, women have to have themselves in control in ways that are detrimental to their uh, social connection with other people. So, but in any case, I don't know. Um, you guys think there's anything I missed that I should have pointed out about this that that you guys have observed? No, that that's pretty much straightforward. Um, I, I have something that I want to bring up after we get through this because I, I really want to uh, get through it and and talk about the type of mothers that we see today, as opposed to yeah, that's true. That's a good lady. point. So. Okay. Well, I will get it started. Um, it's we've got six minutes left of it, and uh, you know we'll discuss the video and then we'll end the show. So this this could be a normal length show or it could be a short show. We'll see what happens. Come on, play. There we go. Now I have se selected the right settings and everything. And it is being, it's probably because of the changes YouTube has made. Come on. Like a little boy. A good deal to be treated like a little boy and uh, protected from the alligator that's in him, I guess. And this is best done by beginning to accept the little weak part of the little boy that's in there, which uh, is rather lovable. But uh, this hasn't been developed enough yet. Perhaps if the mother sees the need. She seems to be prepared to deal with this part of him again. She has the same patterns that he has in a different way. But I guess uh, without realizing it, she's probably been exposing him to this rather aggressive way of dealing with things. The point is they need help. Oh, they need help. Yes, they, uh, this family was really at, uh, in a, a very tight jam and they needed something or somebody to see that there were other ways of living than the way that uh, they had been living. Otherwise, the boy couldn't have lasted in school or gone through school, perhaps. Well, this may have been his way of letting everybody know that uh, there was something wrong and uh, some help had to be given to him. This is a symptom and he's crying out to get the pain relieved, so to speak. It is seven months. This is something that um, hugely we've forgotten as a society with uh, with boys and, and, and young men that when they act out um, in, in ways that are, you know, contrary to social norms and contrary to effective and... Uh, I guess functional uh, social relationships as opposed to like you know, conflict and, and problems between people that it's usually a symptom of, of uh, something that needs to be changed a symptom of uh, either a psychological disorder or an environmental you know disorder something that's caused by abuse or neglect or uh, being mistreated in you know in school, being um, socially isolated, things like that. It's not because masculinity is bad, and it's not because society has molded masculinity in bad ways. It's because we are robbing boys and men of compassion as part of their communities. Community compassion for women is in broad supply pun intended right but it's it's men too men have huge com community compassion for women as as a population they do everything for us but uh compassion for boys and men is is definitely uh, in a huge shortage mm -hmm. the silence is deafening yeah and i think um we we keep talking about stories of um, 
it, it, people who explode, I guess, would be the thing. Pressure builds up of one type or another. And it's it's usually young men and teenage boys that, that make headlines for this. In a school shooting or a um, public, very public suicide or some, you know, some situation where there's a, a murder-suicide and things like that in their home. And when we end up talking about this stuff, you know, people bring up, in particular, psychologists and other feminists will bring up the so-called masculinity crisis. And they'll they'll bring up their ideas of toxic masculinity. And then they'll bring up the reticence of of boys and men to cooperate or even seek out treatment for psychological illness or conditions. But when they go seek treatment, they don't get what we saw here in this video. They get condemnation. Mm -hmm. They get lectured. They get treated like they're the bad guy, not like they're in need of something to change their trajectory but like their trajectory is a deliberate offense against their community that they chose mm -hmm. with no extenuating circumstances contributing to it and it's sad um, because basically what what that amounts to is us throwing them away like here this yeah. one's garbage let's crumple him up and stick him in the bin and uh, and anything that he hurts, anyone that he hurts, any environment that, that he damages um, in, in his explosion, right, in his self-destruction when he goes off, uh, that's just collateral damage and will exploit it politically. And that's the attitude our culture seems to take. If we could get back to this, where we recognize that boys need... To be loved first and and to be treated as human beings and in particular as children when they're growing up and that when they engage in dysfunctional behavior it is not an affront to society it's a cry for help um, we, we might actually be able to reduce these incidents significantly yeah I mean that would be nice but you know that's not that's not the message that we give them it's it's not only that you're bad and wrong for being the way that you are but if you don't conform then then we really have no use for you you know you have to to reject everything that you know and that you know what i mean you have to yeah. reject your your whole self just to, so that you can belong to this amorphous cloud of, of society. You know what I mean? You have to conform and you can't be an individual. It's, it's disgusting. I mean, you can't be a boy. No. You know, that's the sad part. If you want to be part of society, you know, what we're seeing modern, modern culture tell boys that uh, enact these cries for help is, well, you know, you, you're going to have to stop being a boy. We can't accept you like that. It, and I think a, a lot of, in a lot of ways, that's really a driving force um, and for, you know, a, a lot of transitioning, a lot of identifying as trans, is that we're, we're seeing boys get told that they're defective their masculinity is defective. Being a boy makes them defective. Being male makes them bad and wrong and an affront to society. Well, their only solution is to stop being male, right? Or just be gay. Yeah. <laughs> or trans. <laughs> you know, or take cause... themselves out. Like they, <laughs> yeah. they either stop being or they stop being male. And, you know, and, and so you get male feminists that, that are self-hating, that are condemning all men that use feminism to browbeat everyone around them and mm -hmm. uh, and and use it to excuse their dysfunction or you get you know boys that push back and most of the time they're okay or you get boys that become part of the rainbow alphabet mafia 
right? Or or you get suicide. And it just one, might be one a driving way factor in the um, epidemic of male suicide. Yeah, I, I was just saying one way or the other. That's that's almost where you end up. Mm -hmm. You know, and and the statistics just bear that out. And you know, we wonder what we we don't even wonder. We don't even care. Well, not we, not us, not y'all, but you know, they right. don't care about these young men just killing themselves. They don't care about that. It's not, it, it's a problem when girls are starting to, their numbers of, of suicide are starting to increase. That's a problem. Oh my God, we need to figure out why women are starting to kill themselves more often. Yeah, yeah. It, it, <laughs> Yep, and then, see, Derek Workman pointed out, but rapid onset gender dysphoria is often female to male. But that, that is a result from a set of factors that, that comes from feminism as well. Like, girls are now being told in school by feminists that uh, boys have everything. There's mm -hmm. a thing called male privilege that they're excluded from. Being, uh, you know, a girl makes their life harder. Um, and there's a, a narrow now, it used to be that there was a very wide definition of femininity that you could, I could, I, I could be, you know, a, a, a cargo shorts wearing, tree climbing, football playing, um, sports photographer and, and an athlete and, uh, not cry when I got injured and, and things like that. Um, get into fist fights with other girls and and be fascinated with mechanical things and and right on down the line as a little girl and still be considered feminine, not be made fun of for wearing a dress to church, not be made fun of for wanting ribbons and bows, um, mm -hmm. you know, like having pink cargo shorts and a big pink bow in my hair didn't seem like a contradiction, right? Um, and uh, and that was normal. Today, if I was a, a, a Zoomer going through school, somebody would have approached me and said, you probably are a boy trapped in a girl's body. Because you do all these things, and all of that femininity that you're trying to, to mimic is just fake. Like, you don't really like bows and, and mm -hmm. dresses and lace and, and so on. High heels? No, you don't you don't really like those. You can't because you're interested in mechanical things and girls aren't, right? Mm -hmm. Like that's that's basically a, a huge step back in my opinion. Um, we should be going the other direction. We should be saying that being interested in in baking and uh, homemaking and things like that don't make a boy unmanly. Right? Being more artistic right. instead of mechanically minded doesn't make a boy unmanly. Um, liking to look snazzy and jazzy and nice doesn't make a boy unmanly. Right? Those That's where we should be going. But instead, we've polarized it and uh, now we have this epidemic. <coughs> Just absolutely epidemic problem of kids with identity crises that are resorting to um, trying to shove all of their identity crises, which are inflicted by all of this, these mixed messages, into the little box of what well, must be gender dysphoria, and I'm trans, or I'm non-binary, or I'm uh, pansexual, or, you know, like, it, it, not that they're all comparable. I, I consider non-binary and pansexual to be made-up things, completely made-up things that just happened, whereas being trans was, was made up a long time ago. <laughs> and um, and it may, and it's, it's, gender dysphoria may be real, but the solution that we've applied to it is butchery. And it's not helping people the way that it was expected to. So, yeah. and, it's, and, but it's all, it's all, it traces back to this influence of feminism where we, uh, and from every angle, masculinity is condemned, femininity is praised, uh, masculinity is made larger than life, 
and femininity is shrunken down to victimhood mm -hmm. of masculinity. And it fuels both both sexes, uh, dysphoria, dysphoria, and um, and faux dysphoria as well. Do you remember back in the day? You know, you and I are both of a certain age. Do you yeah. remember when it was like taboo to, or or like the kid that had the divorced parents? Yeah, it's kind of like that. That was the interesting thing about the kid. You know what I mean? And and it started happening more and more and sort of like, you know, it evolved and, and coming from a, a split home wasn't as taboo anymore. It was just kind of the norm. You know what I mean? Oh, and yeah. kids kind of yeah. just learn to deal with, with that in their own, you know, ways. And, you know, then it was, well, now my mom's dating a woman. <laughs> and so <laughs> your mom, you have two moms, you know what I mean? And it's just this, evolution of of um wow what what's I, i'm saying this wrong and, I, and i'm i'm gen x had this yeah. journey and we ended up becoming uh people who recognize that you are not responsible for your family's um baggage right mm -hmm. you're not responsible for your family shit like right. For for instance, yeah, your parents are divorced and, it, and your situation sucks, but it doesn't reflect on you. Like you're still picked in whatever order you were going to be picked for for uh, a dodgeball, for instance. You know, yeah, like I I I was I went from early in in um, middle school, I guess you would call it, uh, which was just the end of elementary school for my age group. We didn't we didn't have middle school. I don't know if the, it existed in bigger cities, but where I grew up, um, the community wasn't big enough for that. So about fifth or sixth grade, um, the kids suddenly started to realize that even though I wasn't great at the throwing part, I was superb at the dodging part. And so I would still be one of the last people because um, I did things... I, that were kind of acrobatic. I could run up the walls and jump over people. So <laughs> it was like this weird, um, weird kid that, uh, and, and, you know, I had, I watched other kids. There were kids in my class that were divorced and people knew, you know, well, you know, so-and-so can't come over and play this week because they're at mom's house or they're at dad's house and we had one mm -hmm. classmate that lived with grandparents because the parents couldn't um get along well enough to have custody and their behavior toward each other had been harmful to the child and one of their parents uh, sets of parents was like all right fuck this we're going for custody and the court gave the grandparents custody because the grandparents proved to the court that they would provide a more stable environment, a uh, loving and, and nurturing environment for the child and the parents, and um, which was which was interesting, uh, you know, because they're the ones that raised one of those parents. Yeah. But in any case, what we didn't know for years was that it wasn't because the parents were dead. You know, we we thought, oh well, you know, she must have lost her parents as a kid, and then I think we might have been in junior high or high school before most of us, most of the class, found out. No, her parents are just assholes. Um, mm. You know, well, that's not her fault. You know, like yeah. you learn that, and nothing changes, right? Right. So, I think the mistake that Gen X made in teaching our children was we were kind of a we were raised by people that invented the concept i guess of different strokes for different folks people mm -hmm. you accept people for who they are and you deal with people on the level of who they are mm -hmm. even if you have somebody that's a habitual liar all right well this person is a habitual liar we're not going to hate them for it but we're not going to trust them right yeah. we're just going to we're going to have the relationship we can have with them and we're not going to try to have a relationship with them uh, as if they're somebody else. Mm -hmm. And and that was that was the flower generation, flower power generation, sort of the end of the boomers. And, right. Uh, right. So we get raised in that mentality. Um, 
And we get, you know, like even we even had a TV show growing up with that as the title, Different Strokes. Now it was based yes. on that whole idea, right? So we we ran with that, with this understanding of all right, people are who they are. You know, you you have the relationship you can have with people. You take them at face value. You don't pretend that they're better than they are, and you don't condemn them for things that are beyond their control. Like their family has an asshole. Okay, so their family has an asshole. So does your body. Do you condemn your face because your body has an asshole? You know, no. <laughs> <laughs> so we we sort of, that's one of the reasons why we felt like we had made great strides of progress in in suppressing racism and sexism and all of the other isms, right, and phobias and blah, blah, blah. Um, we didn't care. We got We got to the point where we didn't care if you were gay. We didn't care if you were trans. We didn't care where your ancestors came from or what, what religion they grew up with and all of that. As long as you didn't pull shit on us and do shit to us, um, mm -hmm. you know, that was, that was all good. You, you just, you be you, you do you, we'll do us. We'll have the relationship we can have and we won't try to have the relationship we can't have. And, uh, and right. that worked until we had kids and tried to teach it to them and communicated it badly and went way overboard with helicopter parenting. And yeah. there's such a failure in, in we, we didn't let our kids fall, right? We didn't let our kids fuck up. We didn't let our kids taste uh, pain and suffering and mm -hmm. fight it out with each other and learn to value negotiation because beating each other up hurts no matter who wins the fight. Like right. we as a generation failed miserably on that. There's only a small percentage of us that were, were like, stop doing that. That's bad. You know, don't, don't punish the whole class when, when, uh, Brad and Johnny get into a fight because Brad is angry and hits Johnny and don't punish Johnny for responding, for defending himself. Like, you know, and, and don't stop the fight unless it gets out of hand and they're seriously injuring each other. Let them figure out that talking it out is better than duking it out. And like, we stopped. Um, our, our parents let that happen. Our parents let us come home from school and be alone for half an hour, you know, when we were 10 or 11 years old, nine sometimes. And, and I mean, I had a neighbor that was a latchkey kid when he was five. Jesus. You know, he he would come <laughs> home, make himself a sandwich, and sit in front of the TV and do his homework. Or not. You know, he might not do his homework until his mom got home and said, did you yeah. do your homework? You know, but, and, you know, and there, and there were problems with that. But he also, I mean, he's a Marine now. So. <laughs> That's That's yeah, amazing. Yeah, there's, there's a lot that we screwed up. Um, yeah. And, 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 and it. It does differentiate us dramatically from the, the understanding that we have now. And that's part of the reason why we have all these idiot ideas about gender and, and masculinity. Thank, thank, you, um, thank you. You like landed the plane for me. I was just that is where exactly where I wanted to go and say that this is this is that was where the foothold for this uh, identity politics really, I think, took place. Yeah. And um you know, that's why you won't see psychologists actually trying to honestly uh, observe a child these days. I mean, for many other reasons, but, you know, imagine, imagine trying to do this job. You can't fix a problem if you can't properly diagnose, diagnose it. And if True. you're being if you're being given all of these, uh, you know, in my line of business, there's there's a thing called troubleshooting, right? So you you start with one place, and then you go to the next obvious thing, and then you go to the next obvious thing, and if all of those are wrong, then you go here, and then you go there, and and I think those rules have been just misinformed by all this feminist fucking destruction <laughs> and and here we are yeah 
You know, healthcare has <clears throat> healthcare has the same thing, right? Mm-hmm. When you have a a condition that you go for treatment of this condition, like this sucks, I don't let's change it. You know, the 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 Beavis um, uh, epiphany. This sucks. Change it. Uh, and and you go to the doctor, you sit in the doctor's office, and you tell the doctor, I have these symptoms, and you lay out the symptoms. Your doctor doesn't just pronounce, a, you know, well, we're going to give you this pill and it's all better. Right? If you got a good, decent doctor anyway, they don't do that. It's like They look at your environmental causes. They look at your potential uh, genetic causes, your diet, your exercise, your behavioral causes. You know, is this chemical? Um, And unfortunately, in psychology, we don't have very many good doctors anymore. So, you come along and you're dealing with depression. They give you Prozac. They don't, you know, unless you come out with, all right, I'm going through this situation and I've identified it as the cause of my depression. And they still might prescribe you Prozac. Um... You know, or some some other serotonin reuptake inhibitor, but uh, they don't necessarily deal with well. How do you resolve the situation that is causing your depression? You know, and so when boys and men go in there, I and say I'm I'm unable to connect with the opposite sex. I can't find a girlfriend. I can't even make friends with girls. I'm um um outcast and lonely. That's they don't view that as uh, you know, you're right, that, that would cause a problem. Let's look at why these things are happening to you and what we can do to change your situation for the better. And uh, so they they end up prescribing drugs and telling them, well, it's because your masculinity is toxic. That's it. You don't get to, you don't get to solve the problem. You're just going to have to. It's toxic that you can't just reconcile yourself with being lonely forever. Right? How dare you? You're, you're right. being entitled. Um, but, you know, if a girl goes in there with the same problems, oh, you know, I can't connect with boys, I'm lonely. Well, maybe you have this going on. Maybe they're mean. Maybe you have, maybe you're an abuse victim. You know, there's something you wrong with them. Love. Yeah, you yeah, deserve it, love. <laughs> oh, and and that's, that's the sad thing. So, yeah, we end up with this, we've forgotten everything these people knew. Yeah, yeah, the, the, the disconnect is, is just... Profound. So, yeah. So, see what else they've got to say. Uh, I might have to do this every time. Yeah, I'm going to have to do this every time. Apparently, just think of something to say in the meantime. Here's yeah. some music. <laughs> do, 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 do. <laughs> I, don't, I don't understand. Like, I've said it at the <laughs> least memory hungry setting. The computer should not be doing any kind of Later. update, anything. Here Philip's we go. Philip's mother talks with the psychiatrist who has dealt with the problem, Dr. June Cumberland. How, how do you see Philip now? Completely changed, to say the very least. Mm-hmm. Oh, and improved. Described? Well, he's much more relaxed. He concentrates far more. His, I think his whole personality has changed entirely. Well, certainly I have been aware of the change. He was able to sit here for today for, oh, well, over half an hour without really insisting that he do a tremendous amount of things. And he could uh, play in, a, in some kind of a constructive way. I think it's due to his schooling and due to his visits to you. And maybe, in, in another sense, due to the, the environment that I've tried to change, knowing when I recognized what had to be done. In what way have you... So, it, it's interesting, like, what, what they basically described here, the things that they were objecting to get labeled attention deficit hyperactivity disorder in boys a lot today. And they drug them for it, and they don't address anything in the home. But... Mm-hmm. Notice what the mom did. Like, she gave everybody else credit first and then yeah. talked about the environment that she's changed in the home. Yeah. Not not describing it, but vaguely mentioned it. When, you know, watching the video, I would say the primary problem was, like, the environment that she created in the home. 
I would agree with that. I would agree with that. I think maybe what she's doing here is just maybe trying to show gratitude and giving them the credit first before herself. Because, you know, I, I don't know. It does take a lot of work on, on behalf of everyone involved with the, with the child. But yeah, no, she definitely, I, I want to know what she changed. I want to know what happened in the house. And that's, yeah. that's the other thing. Like, we're just seeing them interview them, but you don't know what the day to day is like. They, you don't have a camera in the living room with them. You know, it, it's not like reality, quote unquote, reality TV that you see these days, you know. Um, so I, I, I'm curious to know what she actually changed and maybe she should give herself more credit. Maybe that was part of the problem in the first place is that maybe she just didn't feel like she she didn't feel empowered <laughs> yeah maybe maybe the kid's finally reaching that age where he really needs his dad around more often we haven't heard that that much from that part of the story yeah apparently the dad is around but he spends a lot of time at work and we don't know whose fault that is we don't know how much work he has to do and how if he'd rather spend more time with the kid or or if he's just as cold as uh as 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 the mother but uh yeah i think kids before the age of i want to say four or five generally just need the coddling of a mother it's, it's when they reach this sort of very active age where they start climbing all over shit and discovering their hands and their fists and all that sort of stuff where it, it really helps for them to have uh, not just two parents but uh, the presence of, of two parents as much as possible yeah, well, I, don't, I don't know. It's just my it's just my pop psychological hypothesis. Um, what I, you know, what I found with um, with parenting um, from the angle of a parent and from being able to remember a lot farther back in my life than it is normal uh, is it it's father involvement goes all the way back to infancy. You know, in a in a household where the parents are married, they live together, they're a team, they work together to raise their children um i you know i can remember how my dad um nurtured my ability to not be terrified of thunderstorms right i, I remember watching the thunderstorm uh, thunderstorm like a show through the picture window in the family room of our old house i must have been around four years old um because we had moved to the the community I mostly grew up in, and um, I I remember him reinforcing something that he must have taught me earlier that it wasn't traumatic, so I don't remember it. Like the, my memories from really early childhood, I think the reason I remember them is because they were traumatic. Like the time my dad uh, had to drive, you know, top speed to the hospital when I had an asthma attack, and uh, the the cop that drove around us and led us through Lima, Ohio with lights and sirens to get us there just in time. Um, but in any case, yeah, I like mom wasn't the person that handled that. That was dad. And I, and I can remember that. And I remember, you know, my son, there's a process when you um, get a toddler used to not being, uh, not falling asleep with the parent in the room. Um, ha not having to have the parent in the room in order to, to fall asleep. Like, they get put to bed, and they stay in bed, and they go to sleep when you're out of the room. Because when you, you have a baby, you nurse the baby, and you rock the baby, and the baby goes to sleep, and you, you know, you swaddle the baby, and, and, and do all this, and the baby goes to sleep, and the baby then gets laid down, and you walk away. Um, so that process is called ferberizing because the guy that came up with it is ferber. And it's basically you listen to the baby cry uh, and, and don't um, coddle when they cry. You can stand nearby and reassure you're okay uh, and you're safe, but not you don't pick them up. You don't, you, you have, they have to learn that um, being upset about just not being picked up and cuddled to sleep doesn't doesn't get them cuddled to sleep anymore. Yeah. And uh, that the mom and dad are still there. And it's 
damn near impossible to do that without a, a dad. Because mom's heart gets ripped out. Like, you, it's having the discipline to not pick up the baby really is, is you need two people. Or you need to be so exhausted that, that you can't respond, which is what I think happens with a lot of single moms. Um, that they, they don't, they don't not respond out of self-discipline. So dads, dads do a lot of, uh, mom needs dad, and the baby needs dad. And it was my husband's voice, not mine, um, that helped my son sort of acclimate himself to, I can do this without being held. I can go to sleep, I can relax and go to sleep. I'm still safe, even if I'm not being held. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's and it. I don't know how single moms handle that. Um, I I I don't I I you know I don't I don't know. I, maybe their kids sleep with them until they're much older, um, and they can <laughs> actually have a discussion about it. Uh, yeah. But that's yeah. That's it's important to the child for dad to be involved way back at the beginning. And it's dad that teaches the kid to get a handle on things like panic and, and rage and stuff like that. Well, we're going to process this. You, they got to see mom doing it, too. But, you know, dad's vital. But, yeah, back then, um, especially, like, there's a lot of clues in this that they have high income. My bet, my guess, is, especially if she is a homemaker, which is... That was still pretty common in the 60s, um, especially middle and upper class families. Like, women didn't have to work, so most of them, like, their work was making the home environment the best they could do. Uh, and uh, so if there was a lot of money being earned, it was being earned by the father. And in that time period, a lot of times that involved uh, very long work hours. So he may not have been able to get time off to be part of this. I, I don't remember if we saw the father at all in this. It's been a long time since the last time I watched it all the way through. Um, I just yeah. It just happened to come back up in my feet, and I'm like, why have we not examined this? And that's kind of why I end up ended up putting it, because I remembered it was good. But yeah. Yeah, he was there, but uh, very briefly. I mean, we did, really didn't get much from him, but he was he was interviewed for it for this. Okay, yeah, and it's for me. I I I just I look at it. You know, um, it's normal in the '60s for us to not see what what the father's contributions are. Um, they're kind of invisible to the rest of the public. The mm -hmm. mother is sort of the face of nurturing in the family, and the father ends up being the the person who does um, his part without being honored for it. Yeah. But uh, but yeah. And then let's see what we have next. Come on. And there goes the. I wonder what's going on with my freaking computer. Because this, this has to be an issue with uh, it's downloading something or you know, whatever. There we go. Well, I find that he doesn't like to be screamed at. Not that any child does. But if you speak to him in a normal way and very nicely, he's less to be, he reacts far better. He's hostile if you sort of, oh, so sort of command him. Okay. Uh, yeah. So she was screaming at say, him. Duh. <laughs> yeah. So so she was screaming at him. Yeah. Basically, like. <laughs> uh. Uh, like I've I've heard mothers do that. Um, and then I've, there's there's another one that that I've heard, you know. Um, and it's sort of the the single mom putting the fear of God into the child, where you know. <laughs> mother is the word for god uh, and and it's it can work if you're relying on authority but it can also handicap your child mentally and psychologically mm -hmm. uh, like 
the mom voice is scary when when the child is being defiant and the mom voice is um as scary when the child is doing something stupid that you have to stop immediately like don't run out in front of that truck you dumbass you know mm-hmm. um which I, so I heard the mom voice cuz I was that kid that acted first and regretted later that's why I ended up with third degree burns on my foot uh but uh I don't, I don't think I ever had to use it on my son or my stepdaughters yeah. And then there's then there's the mom voice that mom uses when dad's not around. Well, yeah. And she, <laughs> that one's the scary one because she, that that that's that's the different kind of mom that, you know what I mean, it, when dad's around, she she doesn't act that way. Yeah. But God, the, uh... she uses the the voice of the bus driver from South Park. <laughs> 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 Uh, yeah, that's that's not how you don't I don't know. You don't you don't if you're screaming at your kids all the time, you're not doing something right. You're not they're not learning from you. Right? Yeah. But it's it's I think I did use them on well, they once, are. but it wasn't on my kid. <laughs> it was on Carly Ellison. Oh jeez. Twice. Oh, I I've used that. the mom voice on Carly Ellison one. twice. I remember that one. That <laughs> sent chills down my spine. I was like, Ooh. Yeah, I, I don't I don't pull that voice out very often. Yeah. You know, I guess for the same reason that you don't run around pointing a gun at people. It's not yeah. it's 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 terrifying. <laughs> yeah. But But you said you said something. You said that he's not learning when she does that, but he is learning. Well yeah. He is learning. <laughs> He's learning how to react in the precise way that she doesn't want him to. Yeah, he's learning bad habits. And, yeah, and it just fuels the be- it fuels the behavior. Yep. It's a vicious cycle, but yeah. And I mean, everybody gets mad, right? You you yeah. can't deny as a human being that you get mad. Even even the even the Bible described Jesus getting mad right then and and when jesus got mad he flipped tables and threw everybody out of the church so it, it for for all of us as just ordinary human beings like whatever you think of you know this is this is a myth this is this is the son of god this is a human being that was deified whatever your beliefs are the description in the bible is intended to be of a deity in human form a higher being with a higher mentality and a higher psychology and he still had a limit where you know all right this this is where you know he snaps and uh, so obviously we all have permission to have a limit we all have permission to get mad it's just it's our job especially when you're dealing with someone you love to try to have a functional reaction to that Mm -hmm. you know like you definitely don't want to flip tables and throw your three-year-old out of the house yeah (laughs) no no you did not unless you want to make the headline news the next day (laughs) yeah oh so let's see what's next Tremendous change in him. And of course he's got much older, he understands more. Oh, I just uh, take him aside and say, look here, if you don't do this, you know, mommy's going to be very angry and he's just going to do it and that's the end of it. Mm-hmm. And if, he, if I'm not interrupted, I succeed. Mm-hmm. If daddy doesn't stand. Yes. Mm-hmm. And he can't go through life wanting everything and getting everything and just smiling and saying, well, I'm going to ask my daddy, he's going to get it for me. Mm-hmm. He has to know there has to be a limit. Mm-hmm. And I've tried to set a limit, but it's never been kept. What happens really is that Philippe plays you and Daddy off against each other very yes. often, then, eh? Mm-hmm. Uh, but you and your husband haven't been able to come together to try and help by getting together to try and help Philippe. No. Has he been aware of the changes in Philippe, or would he say he's much the same? No, he thinks Philippe's improved tremendously. Mm-hmm. Mm. Oh, oh. There we go. He's yeah, he's still definitely a little boy. He's only like 
several months older, not several years older. Though. Yeah, she's like, well, um, she's he's he's much gotten, older. <laughs> there's when it's amazing how much they change though in that little amount of time, especially when they're really little. Like the changes mm. between four years old, like just four years old, and almost five, or between you know midway through four years old and midway through five years old are amazing. So much mm. changes, and and that it, it's even more dramatic in the younger years and it's it doesn't ever stop being a dramatic series of change until the, the kid gets out of the house um but it's it's uh it reduces it's not as dramatic of a set of changes until you hit adolescence and then all hell breaks loose <laughs> you know for a little while um but this this thing about her and the father not being on the same page, like yeah. there's two she, things you... going on there that that are a problem. You know, one of them is that he he may be too lenient. We don't know because we don't know what their what her rule set is and what his rule set is. She may be too strict, right? Mm -hmm. And being that she's highly controlled herself, I'm leaning toward her being too strict. So that she needs to get more on the same page with him if that's the case. The other thing is um, I, I wonder if uh, she's like this, I, I, I'm pretty sure this started in around the 60s because of the whole feminist uh, thing. I wonder if she's one of those women that had the word obey removed from her wedding vows because mm. it wasn't modern. <laughs> they did that? They do that now, yeah. Yeah, like you go into a, a counseling session with the minister, and oh, we want to use our own wedding vows, you know. And a lot of times they'll they'll do that, especially the more progressive yeah. ministers. But yeah. even if you don't use your own wedding vows, like a lot of women do this thing where oh well, I will I'll promise to love, honor, and cherish, but I think it's outdated for me to <laughs> promise to obey. Which is her way of saying, I don't trust him. Yes. Yeah. You you can bet, you know, we sat across, my um, uh, my uncle-in-law was our minister for our wedding. We sat across from him and he said, I want you to understand, I don't remove obey from the wedding vows. And uh, my, my response was, well, you shouldn't. You know, mm -hmm. I, I wouldn't even ask. I trust I trust my husband. I I trust him completely. And that means trusting that he's not going to throw his weight around for the sake of throwing his weight around. Like if he tells me to do something instead of just talking about stuff with me, then he's he's got something going on that he feels very adamantly about. There's a del a, a specific um deliberate concern there that he's he's analyzed and you know, I trust his judgment on that. Um, that's not... You know, <laughs> they... Women treat it as a... Subservience. Mm -hmm. It's not a subservience. It's... You recognize that your husband is fulfilling his protector role. And don't hinder him from doing that. Right? That's That's what that is. Recognize that he's taking responsibility of head of the household... And don't hinder him from doing that. So exactly. when she can't get on the same page with her husband, <clears throat> she's probably being pushy about how to raise the kid. And she's not listening. And she's probably not, uh, you know, taking his authority into question that no. comes with being the head of the household. But I'll no. bet you at tax time, at bill paying time and and at time the time when it's uh you know necessary for one member of the household to stand between the rest of the household and some threat she recognizes his authority then exactly exactly and i mean forgive me if i'm wrong i could be i mean jesus i i do not remember marriage vows but don't men and women both have to promise to obey no. one no, another? No, 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 no. Not, not under, at least not in the Christian faith. 
Okay. Um, that is that is not how it works, right? Oh, and yeah. and there's a there's a set of Bible verses that go with that, right? <laughs> Women are you know, are admonished to submit to your husband. Men are admonished to love their wives. Well, love is self-sacrificing, right? Love is protective. Love is caring. Love is invested in the other person's welfare. Love is humble. Yeah. And so women have to, the word submit has to be used for women to understand it. Yeah. But when someone tells you to love someone, when you get a commandment to love, you're being told to submit. Mm-hmm. Right? Okay. And so obey means trust. Mm-hmm. It does. Right? Men are not ordered to trust their wives. Because it's their job to find a wife they can trust. They can trust. To vet their women for character. And that is something that we aren't even allowed to talk about anymore. Mm -hmm. it's what What's ruined marriage, why we have such a high divorce rate in our generation, and why it's 70% female initiated, is because our parents' generation, one of the ways that they fucked up was teaching us that vetting women for character like you would vet a business partner for character, like you would vet a friend for character, a trusted friend for character, right? Uh, like you would vet a comrade you expect to have your back for character. It's somehow misogyny. Mm. How dare you consider a woman to be capable of less than perfect character? Right. Right. So, Jesus. so yeah, um, I, it's, and the sixties was, uh, kind of the heyday of women deciding that they didn't have to contribute their, their trust and their character to the relationship that you make with a partner when you get married. Right, like there was that that existed in the early twentieth century. That existed in the nineteenth century. Like that happened. Women were doing that. They were building that and growing it. Um, this this weed in the garden of marriage, right? But in the sixties, it exploded all over everything. Just vomited up vitriol <laughs> and and uh, just acid and and dirt you know like somebody planted a bomb in that garden and all yeah. of a sudden everything is covered in shit and that's you know the divorce rate skyrocketed uh, and and so did the rate of teenage problems all of a sudden in the 90s we had this epidemic of teenagers ending up in mental health care you know mental health institutions and and therapy and so on like, you're 17 years old and you have so many problems that a psychiatrist has to deal with them. Yeah. And yeah. and it was common, not rare. Like, kids would get locked up for weeks or months, for however long their insurance would cover it in, in mental health. And so there were articles about this, like Red Book Magazine. I remember when I was a uh, young mom um, reading about this and parents having their teenagers incarcerated and just keeping them in. And part of the problem, you know, was was this environment of um, animosity between partners in the home. The home environment wasn't working. But part of the problem was that, you know, insurance was being capitalized on, too. Like, that fueled a lot of yeah. it. There was a lot of exploitation there, too. Oh, so. God. Still is. There still oh, yeah. is. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, you guys don't know it, but you're all neurotic. And if you walk into a psychiatrist's office right now, they will find something to treat. And you'll be, you'll have problems that they need to treat as long as your insurance will pay for the treatment. And then yep. as you'll, you'll miraculously be better as soon as your insurance coverage runs out. Exactly. <laughs> that's, that's true. It's pathetic, but it's true. I can can you imagine if oncologists did that? Oh yes, you you totally have cancer, uh, and you're gonna need these chemicals for the next twenty years. No, it's not showing up on any kind of testing. We we can't test for this. It's a uh, it's an invisible type of cancer. Uh, it it's disgusting. You know, 
it doesn't really need to be said that our our healthcare system needs some real reform. Um, and to anybody out there that thinks that universal health care or nationalized health care is any better, <laughs> you're, you're out of your mind. Yeah. It's all shit. It's all shit. You know, it's only designed. Well, not designed, but the way it's being run right now is they want a, they want a, a patient for life. That's it. Yep. <laughs> you know, they don't care. They do not care. And if you are not, you know, God, if you're just not on top of it, if you're not paying attention, you can get screwed. Like you're in, oh my God, the, the, the they miss bill these things on insurance quotes all of the time, you know? And, oh yeah. Oh my God. It, it's, it's just horrendous and people don't know they just want to feel better you know and god it, it the way they are raping us is is <sighs> when i when i had my c-section um i uh i got i accidentally got the bill it wasn't my accident they accidentally sent me the bill mm-hmm. instead of it, it you know that they were going to send to my insurance and uh so I'm I'm looking at this because you know the amount that it was it was bigger than I expected. It might my copay to be, and it took me a while to figure out. Oh, this this is it doesn't um, it's not what I have to pay. It's what the insurance needs to pay, and they sent it to the wrong place. So, but I'm going through because there, there were items and everything, and I'm I'm looking at there was there was medication, and uh, there were more billings for medication than there were medications that I had taken because I I couldn't stay conscious on pain medicine so like after the first pill they gave me when it knocked me out and everything I recovered from my c-section without pain medicine because I couldn't stay conscious and I didn't want to miss the first days of my kid's life and um and they they had billed for what they gave me and they had also billed for what they normally give. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I, I had contacted billing. Well, what's this code mean? What what drug is this? And they're telling me, well, we you know, this is for this. This is for that. And one of them was for, for uh, Tylenol 3 with codeine. And I'm like, okay. I was not handed Tylenol 3 with codeine because I wouldn't swallow that. And it I didn't have an IV at any point in time after the after the birth. I know they didn't give it to me while I was in labor. It's not in the uh, epidural. And it says right there on my chart that I'm allergic to it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm allergic to all opiates. I'm allergic to fucking poppy seeds. Even from the ones that don't come from the plant that the drugs come from. Right. Jesus so I know Christ. I didn't take codeine. I contact the insurance. They they billed for codeine. I didn't take codeine. They billed for codeine and the pain medicine that they did give me. Um, and uh, so they fixed that. But that happens all the time. And most of the time, you have no idea because your insurance yeah. company pays it. And you, mm-hmm. you don't get the itemized bill. And you don't find out that, oh, yeah, they said they gave you these drugs that you never took. Yeah. You know, or they said they did this test that was never run. And uh, they said they did this procedure that never happened. And yeah, it's 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 different than like going to a grocery store and getting a receipt and you go home and you say, all right, well, I bought that, I bought that, but I don't know what this is. I didn't buy that. You know, it's it's so different, but it's so similar in the very same way. It's just that you don't have the education the knowledge to to read an itemized bill people don't have the wherewithal to even ask for one you know and then when the bill comes due it's just oh my god this is another bill i have to pay i gotta pay it or because medical bills you can't i don't think you can claim bankruptcy if you have excessive medical bills you can claim medical bankruptcy Um, okay especially if you're disabled Uh, in fact i think you have to have some level of of disability for that but uh, you you can also do. I think medical bills can come off with bankruptcy if you um, 
you know, and, and then the other thing is, you know, a lot of people just put their medical bills on their credit card anyway, so the yeah. facility gets paid, but you still end up declaring bankruptcy, uh, you know, but yeah, when, when it comes to, when it comes to uh, situations like this, you know, the the worst part of it, in my opinion, is that what they basically had done was, um, oh, C-section birth, okay, here are the standard things that are done, and I, I don't really think they give coding as a standard after birth thing if the mother is nursing, but that's what they had. Uh, maybe there weren't, maybe it wasn't as common to nurse in, in 99 as, uh, as it was in, in the, the 80s and the 70s and the 50s and before. Um, I don't know. I like think it's, it is important, but, um, but they just assumed, well, there's the standard, this is a standard procedure, we're going to bill for the standard procedure, nothing is listed as abnormal that they did, they didn't list having done anything more than the standard procedure, so we don't bill for anything extra, oh wait, no, here's this other medication, well, we'll just add it onto the bill, they wouldn't have given those medications together, that would have killed me, <laughs> um, yeah. probably a normal person, it would have knocked him out, <laughs> right, but... In any um, case, yeah, it, that's, it, I, it, I think it, that's how that kind of medical billing mistake happens. You're like, oh, this is what we normally do, so we'll bill for that. I, I, I gotta say, it, it blows me away because I, you know, when thinking about having a kid, it costs money. Even if you have insurance, it costs oh, yeah. money to have a kid. I can't, where do these single mothers who keep popping out baby after baby after baby, who is paying these hospital bills for all these kids that are being born. Oh, Lauren, you are. I know. <laughs> Our listeners are. It's right? just unbelievable. That's, that's that, that. that it's unbelievable. The people who actually care and think and plan and prepare ahead, we are the ones that get fined. We are the ones that have to pay the cost. We pay <laughs> the cost for our own children to be born. And on top of that, we're still paying for all of these Rep these god these bastard kids being born every day to the same twenty percent of guys out there. Yep. Uh, and and our situation is that you pay for it multiple times, right? You pay mm -hmm. for the expenses related to bringing a kid into the world. You pay for the health and human services department. You pay mm -hmm. for the the uh, funding that gets you know sent to these mothers from the various agencies within the health and human services department, and then you pay for the child's education, mm -hmm. and, you know, in your community, and you also pay for systems that are are designed to not help the child if he experiences dysfunction like juvenile detention facilities, right? And then if the child doesn't get the the child rearing he needs and the help he needs and so on, then you pay for his welfare. Like if he goes on, on programs with Health and Human Services, or if he gets sucked into the mass incarceration sy system, you pay for that. You pay for the extra security that's that's needed in your community because of the uh, failures of these parents and the failures in child rearing. You pay for services we need as as, as a community to protect your home and to rehabilitate people and to have a war between. Um, our our hired mercenaries as a community, our gang of thugs, and the gangs of thugs that are selling drugs that make the problem worse, right? Mm -hmm. You pay through the nose. Most of your tax dollars go to fund the dysfunction of fatherless homes. Mm -hmm. So there you go. Um, you pay for military to defend the United States, and then they send them to war in other countries that have conflicts that should have nothing to do with us. And the only reason that they do have anything to do with us is because our government has had their fingers in those conflicts for years. Mm -hmm. Without cause. 
uh, you know, and other countries might attack us because they think we're weak because of the, the whole fatherless homes problem. There you go. Well, I mean, yeah, look at what we're doing. And this, this is, this is what I was trying to, uh, talk about it in the beginning or what I wanted to talk about in the beginning of the show. Um, <clears throat> There's a video, uh, some chick, I don't know why she thought this was a good idea, but she posted a video to TikTok. I guess she was waking up and she's got three young sons. I think the oldest one was like nine, the eight and six and whatever. And so they're waking her up. And so she's starting the video and they go, yeah, you know, mommy, we, we have to, we have to check on you. Cause you know, you don't have a man. And so, you know, like we're your young men. We're like your young man. Oh, we're your, yeah. And this is what they're doing. This is what is being created now is the son husband generation. Uh. Okay. These women are treating their young sons as if they have to be the head of the household, the man of the house, no matter how young they are. Yeah. And it, it, it's, it was sickening to see in the video because these young minds have just absorbed it as, as if it's just, oh yes, this is what we're, we have to take care of mommy. No, little man, your mother, and your father is supposed to be taking care of you, not the other way around. It, it, this is completely flipped on its head. You yep. know, you, you see women talking about, uh, oh, they, they are raising their kids to, to be the, the young boys. They want them to be athletes or young rappers. You know what I mean? Just so they can get taken care of. It's completely flipped on its head. That's not the way this works, lady. And it's all because we have just given deference to women. And this, this is how they want their society. They don't want the men in, in their lives. They don't want the fathers in the household. They don't want the men around their children. Okay, well, this is what you're raising. And you you would have to be would have to be of another mind to not know that China knows this. Yep. China knows yeah. what we're raising. China knows <laughs> they are. They, we are. If China have, knows and Russia knows, and the yes, reason they know is because the pathway to this was broadened by a <laughs> communist psyop. Yep. on the United States that was effective mm -hmm. because women were open to it. Yep. So, yeah. Um. And they use and <laughs> they use social media to get all of your information. So, forget it. Like we are cooked. We are fucking cooked. <laughs> It's it, it's partly why I wanted to look back at this. This is a simpler time this, that this represents, right? The problem in this household, the problem this boy was facing was that his mother needed to grow up a little bit. That was mm -hmm. the primary issue. She needed yeah. to stop being so self-conscious about how she handled, um, you know, her relationship with her kid and start being more conscious of him and his needs. Mm -hmm. And including his need to learn things uh, like how to deal with his emotions productively and how she needed to model that. Right. That's, and, and she still is part of the problem. There are still going to be problems in that house and there are still things that, that will need to change um, based on what she just said. Right. That's, that's a much easier to remedy problem in a time period where women could say, I, I am part of the problem. I need to fix these things about myself so that I can help my, my family. Right? And today, the problem is that we can't do that. That we've completely created an environment of dysfunction, lack of accountability, and insecurity for, for children. Uh, and, and it's the norm now. So, yeah. It's it's interesting to look back at this and see the difference. Um, yeah. Let's let's go on and see the the kid play a little bit here and see what else they have to say uh, on the subject. If I can get this stupid video to play. Come on, <laughs> here we go. Do you worry about getting things on your 
Him? <coughs> Why? Because I'm afraid my mother's going to give me a hit. You afraid mommy um, will hit you for getting yourself dirty? Yeah. Mm -hmm. oh. See, that's, Do you like that's... to be dirty? Could you tell her we at the paint? Mm-hmm, I'll tell her. You're worried Boys you're are supposed angry. to get dirty. Yeah. Girls are supposed to get dirty. Angry. Yeah. Mommy yeah. Mommy yeah. For the baby. Mm -hmm. What you going to do? Can't spank her, and there's a father after mother. Mm -hmm. What's mommy and what's daddy going to do? Spank the mother, and, and the mother's going to spank the baby. Mm -hmm. Well, he has the hierarchy oh, of authority yeah, down. Mommy, mommy <laughs> the baby. Wow. How does the baby feel? It took the time in revealing yeah. this little nugget of information, yeah. didn't it? Yeah. yeah, right. People have fights in your family. Sometimes. Who fights in your family? My mom. Uh -huh. And papa. Uh -huh. And what do you feel like when they have an argument? I feel like I'm sad. Uh -huh. You feel sad inside? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you tell them you feel sad inside? When they punish me, I'll feel sad for them. Mm -hmm. Why do you feel sad for them when they punish you? Because I, I feel sad. Mm -hmm. Do you ever feel angry inside? I sure do. Mm -hmm. When do you feel angry? When they, when they start to tell me what to do. Mm -hmm. You don't like to be told what to do. No, I'll tell them what to do. So you have a couple of things going on there. Mm -hmm. Um. So the first thing I'm going to point out is it's okay for the kids to see mommy and daddy having an argument when mommy and daddy argue with love. Here's my perspective. What's your perspective? I disagree yeah. with your perspective. Here are my reasons. And, and then in the end, they can resolve it. Oh, I get this about your perspective. And oh, thank you for getting this about my perspective. And maybe we're going to compromise this way, or maybe we're going to do it your way, or maybe, you know, you, you agree we're going to do it my way, you know, and, and based on what we have learned from the discussion with each other about what's important to the other person and what information the other person is basing their decision on and everything. And, uh, and that's, that's reasonable, right? I saw my parents do that growing up. My, my kids saw us do that growing up. And you can even get impatient. Sometimes you're, you're going to snap at each other in stressful situations. That's not abnormal. Like, that's normal. It's also important for your kids to see how you deal afterwards with that. You know, mommy snapped at daddy and then said, I'm sorry, that wasn't right. I shouldn't have done that. You know, or daddy snapped at mommy and then said, I'm sorry, that wasn't right. I shouldn't have done that. And and reassuring each other that you still love each other and, and that that's not the relationship, the, the way that your relationship is, that you are mean to each other because you disagree. And unfortunately, in a lot of relationships, people's egos get in the way and they don't listen to each other and they don't care as much about the other person's perspective and the information on which the other person's decisions are based as they do about getting their point across and getting the other person to surrender. And uh, I think that that leads to a lot of responses like this kid. The kid is sad because he's helpless to remedy the situation and he knows mm -hmm. that something bad is going to come out of that behavior. Like... Con continued conflict, continued animosity, yelling, um, a harsh environment, or divorce. Right? So, and he doesn't, he doesn't learn, what he learns from them is that when someone tells you what to do, when someone contradicts your uh, interests, your beliefs, your information, your thoughts, whatever, you get mad. Mm -hmm. And so, that's what he does. He gets mad. play. Damn it. Nope. <laughs> You'd like there we go. The one who controls everything in your family, eh? Yeah. I like him tremendously. <laughs> he's warm, he's outgoing, he's charming. I love and that little he's, smile. When he's happier, he's a delightful little boy to have around. He's bright. You can discuss with him all sorts of things. His comprehension is very good. 
And we enjoy having him very much. We have other children with the same problems due to other reasons. But with his help, uh, and of course they do get sedation medicine to help them to learn to live with themselves, not be hyperactive. See, that Breath started back in the yeah. late 50s, yeah. early 60s. But we've seen some wonderful mm -hmm. results in the past. They do get sedation. She sounds like she's had some sedation. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, you know, it's like people people thinking the kids are the ones going, I want to be sedated. No. <laughs> no, that was the women. Right. Women women uh, took to sedation pretty quickly. That's where Mother's Little Helper came from, right? Um, but most kids don't need drugged. Very rarely is there something so out of balance at that age that they need drugged to change their psychology. Now, some kids do. You, you know, kids need drugged for all, all kinds of other things. Allergies, uh, illnesses that have, um, other, like, eat, they, there's even... I, the reason that uh, hormones that sort of put off um, or change the progress of someone's puberty are called puberty blockers is because they used to use them to delay the onset of a girl's period if she started too early. Uh, and there's, there's uh, evidence that starting too early can um, reduce the length of your life significantly, you know. Uh, and so, it's one thing, you know, she starts at like 10, 11, 12, 13, but occasionally one will start when she's 8 or younger, and a doctor will prescribe medication to put that off for a few years so that she can get older before she her body starts putting her through all the things that your body puts you through when it's getting ready to conceive. Um, so there's there's that. Uh, but for the most part, you don't have to drug kids for, for most reasons. And when I was growing up, I like, Lauren, when you were growing up, did you know very many kids that were on a lot of medication? No. God, hmm. none. Right. I was the kid that was on a lot of medication. I had steroids and... and uh, antihistamines and decongestants and all that shit because of my asthma, right? But there was there were physical symptoms that were um, uh, the reason for all of that, that, that were dangerous. You know, like, I, I multiple times my body tried to kill itself um, just, you know, in response to ordinary things. Mm. But I, I didn't know anybody personally... I think until I was in high school that had been medicated for attention deficit disorder. No, no, mm -hmm. I did. I knew one boy. Um, and he had been prescribed medication for attention deficit disorder. And his mom took it mm. to get high. Oh, Jesus. And he, he didn't have attention deficit disorder. Uh, the classic psychological attention deficit disorder. He had a deficit of parental attention. Right. <laughs> Apparently. <laughs> right. It's the other attention deficit disorder. <laughs> right. But I, did, I didn't know anybody that actually was prescribed those drugs due to the chemical imbalance that, that um, makes it uh, difficult for them to, to focus and, uh, and needed them um, for, for any length of time till I was in high school. That was when I first first met, and then the kid wasn't a kid that was local to me. This was somebody that I met through um, being being involved in the Great Lakes Interscholastic Press Association. So, <laughs> and I met a kid there with ADHD. Um, but yeah, yeah, I've, I've never known anyone that that was actually, admittedly to me, prescribed or you know. Yeah. Anything, but I mean, uh, thinking back, I think there might have been maybe one or two people who maybe could have benefited yeah. <laughs> from it, but no, no. Well, like when we were the the age of high school kids and early college age, 
that's when there there was this explosion of schools prescribing Ritalin and uh, I think what's the other one Adderall yeah. came out about that time it might be newer than that mm-hmm. but I think it came out about that time all of a sudden there was this constant you, you're hearing about you know whole classrooms full of kids and we've got we've actually got a super chow on this Richard Pierre has given us two super chows the first one was five dollars and said but we enrolled him in the finest boarding schools and hired the best nannies so this shouldn't be happening yes. you know and then uh, he he gave us another five dollars and said, "Remember when the big diagnosis from schools, and it was from schools, by the way, was ADHD or ADD, and how entire classes, if not schools, were diagnosed as such, and then also medicated into being compliant students." Pepperidge Farm remembers. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I I remember because my dad was very upset about it. Um, you know, it, it it's it was being used as a crutch, right? Uh, parents and and schools. Uh, we're using it as a crutch to avoid having to act as mentors to kids. Well, we're not going to mentor you. We're just going to make you take these drugs, and it'll be all good. Right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I remember that very much. It's very unfortunate um, that 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 happened and uh, continues to happen. So... And uh, let's see. Meredith G gave us five dollars and said HBR Talk two eighty three by making femininity synonymous with victimhood, it has devalued it so much that we are taught to dislike it. That's why crazy people want to erase gender. My dad taught me how to sew and iron because his family worked in the garment industry. He also taught me how to fix things around the house and how to change a tire and check my oil. We need to stop categorizing these skills as masculine and feminine and start calling them what my yes. mother called them. Life skills. Yes. Yeah. Well, my dad. My dad always said, you know, I I learned to develop film in the dark room and print pictures, um, to compose properly and capture the right moments in for news, um, publication, in uh, you know events, uh, various events, including sports, uh, even sports that I didn't play and didn't know all the rules of. You know, like. All the the uh, ins and outs and and everything. I couldn't name every position on a football team, even though like as a little kid I played it with the boys. They basically would hand me the ball and say run this way, or they would say you know knock this person down, or stop this person from knocking that person down. You know like that was it. There was there was no you are this do this uh, and yeah. and because uh, at that age. You know, it was like, oh yeah, well, this there's another kid on our team. We're yay, we've got a whole team. Um, yeah. But if we'd have been pig farmers, I'd have learned to raise pigs. I'd have been slopping the hogs. Um, mm-hmm. You know, if if my parents were in medicine, well, heck, my grandmother was in medicine, and I know more about medicine than your average layman because of it. There's a lot of stuff that. I, you know, I I grew up with medical hand washing as a norm in my household. Now, everything that the public learned about hand washing um, during the COVID crisis, I already knew that by the time I was five. Mm-hmm. So, but yeah, uh, like that's 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 the norm. You teach your kids, but not not anymore. You know, now you teach them that their gender is messed up. Uh, Richard Beer gave us five dollars and said, "Wasn't it in the 1960s when a whole lot of housewives were being put on tranquilizers, or was that the 70s?" <laughs> Actually, that started, I want to say, the early 50s and continued on indefinitely. Like the, the tranquilizers have changed, but they they were prescribing quaaludes in the 70s. Um, there are ads in old 1970s magazines for how quaaludes can help you deal with life. Oh my god. Not kidding. Um, <laughs> not kidding. Uh, let's see. There were oh, there were uh things like, you know, Thorazine and and other zombie drugs. There were uh barbiturates were prescribed. Mm-hmm. Um the, and then of course there was a time period when you could get codeine over the counter and uh, you could buy it in liquid form. In, in in your cough medicine, and women were using that to tranquilize mm-hmm. themselves because women are naturally pretty neurotic. Uh, and uh, 
especially in compared to men. Um, there's there's a there's low grade neuroses that is just part of women's normal psychology. Yeah. We, we panic over stupid things like a, yes. a critter that is the size of your thumbnail showing up in front of you and 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 looking all scary because it has too many legs. <laughs> Like, I, you can kill this by stepping on it, but you're too scared to approach it because it has too many legs. <laughs> and if you look oh, at listen. it up close, it has googly eyes, but if, if you know, you're not going to get that close because it has too many legs. I um, mean, listen, statistically, I don't like the odds, okay? You know, I'm <laughs> sorry. <laughs> don't like the creepy crawlies. I know. Well, Thanks. I mean, I'll do the holy freaking yucky spider dance, right? The heebie-jeebie <laughs> dance. You know, if one is on me and I wasn't expecting it, but yeah. I, I still see it as nonsense. Like, why the fuck do we do that? You can kill this thing by specking it with your hand. You know why? Because Australia. I think okay, Australia well, yeah, has ruined. <laughs> Australia Yo. has ruined us. For spiders everywhere. It's like everything oh, with anything. They, they, it's just trying to kill us, Hannah. Australia gets a bad rap, but have you ever seen a Brazilian bird spider? No, I don't want to. Do you why know why they're bird, called that? Why? I don't know. <laughs> no, but you're going to tell me. You know, <laughs> it can catch and eat small birds. It's a big enough spider. <gasps> like that thing is, uh, you know, you... you Kill, catch Ugh. those spiders and kill them and cook them and eat them like crabs, right? Those are yeah. Oh my god! Yeah, some spiders are nasty and poisonous. Like I, it's fair to freak out if you see a brown recluse or black widow or red widow or any of those. Or uh, oh, what's the poisonous one in Australia that gives you a night of hell? It's like the hunter spider or the huntsman or something. Yeah, the not husband. to be confused with the um the the uh, huntsman in America that is like basically the daddy longlegger spider that like they can't do crap to you. they can't even bite you their little fangs won't pierce your skin you can let those little guys crawl all over you and nothing will happen um but yeah yeah uh and yeah don't don't look up the bird spider <laughs> you will have nightmares I, I, I won't not trust me <laughs> right but we freak out over those cute little black jumping spiders that that look like you know they were grown in a box, or um, <laughs> wolf spiders, like a yes. wolf spider can bite the shit out of you, and you'll get some itchy red welts, but nothing else will happen unless you're allergic to spider bite. You know that that and which I'm not, <laughs> oddly enough. Mosquitoes, oh my god, really? Mosquitoes, yeah. <laughs> spiders, no. Right, but we still freak the fuck out over that shit. Like we yeah. we, we we get all heebie jeebie and hair standing up and I, I know that there are guys that are arachnophobes too but it's normal for women and guys get treated like you know what the fuck is wrong with you look how little it is yeah yeah so but anyway I you know I've gone off on a tangent um, so we'll we'll watch the last uh, minute well less than a minute here and then we'll be done with the video see if we get any more Chats. We didn't get any super chats, or at this point, we don't have any paid rumble rants that I can see. Um, I'll look again before closing out, just in case. And uh, and then and so we may not have super chats to read. Yes, um, the Australian redback spider, Richard Beer pointed out, is related to the black widow. Yeah, those are scary too. Let's see, play. Really? Of course. There we go. It's a long, drawn-out uh, process. It's the same, you know, the same formula all over again, just a lot of tender, loving care. Philippe is a happier surprise, boy. Surprise, surprise, surprise! Life is a little mm. easier for him, for his parents, for the school. There is a long way to go, but life is long and has many paths. He and his parents and his schools will probably find the right one. Nope, we don't have that much left. So, we're not going to play the um, credits and stuff, obviously, but that, that interesting thing. Nurturing, she mentioned nurturing. <laughs> <laughs> like, oh, nurturing. 
<laughs> Sorry. Like, as, if, as if it was a foreign concept to her. Yeah. Like, oh, yes, yes. And we discovered this thing. It's called nurturing. <laughs> it's like, oh, wow. What a, what a novel concept. Nurture your boys. Nurture their masculinity. Right. And it, don't condemn it. Don't treat it like a an affront to society. Um, but but yeah, yeah. Nurture. How strange. I wonder. I, I wonder. And I'm I'm just going off on my own speculation here. But so you know how she has this this uh, animosity with her husband, right? Yeah. You know how they say like single mothers when they look at their children they they kind of resent them because they look like the father that mm-hmm. left or whatever i think maybe something like that is is going on here right because she's left to deal with this little boy who is a, a replica of his father you know she can't get anywhere with his father she can't scream and argue her way into compliance with this little boy yeah and that's she, I think that that was I don't know if that even clicked in her brain. Yeah. But uh, it, it and really I don't think it did because you see in the end how she realized that it was much easier for her to uh, be nurturing and more caring with the child, but she still has the same problems with the husband, the same conflict. So this is a, so, this is an issue that. It's probably, we like to blame a lot of things on feminism, but I think it's this, this is female nature. Women mm-hmm. take an adversarial role um, against uh, people that, that um, they have to, to compromise with in order to get things done. And it, it's when it comes to your life partnership and, and you know you bring a guy into your family by marrying him. He's now a family member. He's now... Um, a part of your everyday life, he becomes your biggest adversary. I don't, mm. I don't understand it, mm-hmm. but I recognize that that is common practice. And like, it's it's one thing, you know, we razz each other. There's there's masculine and feminine ways of doing things, and there's masculine and feminine ways of experiencing and observing things and everything. And you know, like it's it's normal and healthy and fine for men and women to look at the way that the opposite sex does things and be like, why would you do it that way when it's so much easier to do it this way? What mm-hmm. the hell is wrong with you? We're going to laugh at that, you know, as long as they're not being mean about it or demanding that, that you, you know, you stop doing things in a gendered way. Like when it comes to, you know, if it's not harming anybody. It's perfectly fine for uh, for men, for instance, to not care as much about um, whether you have a stray hair that sticks out to the side when they're talking to you <laughs> as you care about having a stray hair that sticks out to the oh side when they're talking. God. This is the worst yes. thing that has ever happened to me. I'm so embarrassed. Oh my God, I have broccoli on my tooth. Why are you not telling me? Why are you looking at it? My life right. is over, right? Yeah. Um, it, it's perfectly fine for guys to be more okay with some, some risk in their life. Like, I remember being a kid and my brother would pick up bugs that I wouldn't go near. You know, if I knew a bug didn't bite, I was fine picking it up. Like, I picked up crickets all the time. I used to use them to go fishing. Um, mm. But my brother would pick up ants. Like, I'm, I'm not touching that. It's going to pinch me, and, and it doesn't hurt, but it's discombobulating. It's uncomfortable, and I don't like it, and I don't want to touch it, right? This thing might sting me. Okay, no, I'm going nowhere near it, right? It, you know, like that, th- that kind of thing. Um, We both had our different ways of no fear, and I saw that with the kids, too. That's fine, you know, and it's fine for, for girls to laugh at, look how dirty you got, you know, doing that thing, wow, you know, like, doesn't that bother you at all? And it's fine for boys to be like, look how prissy you are about it, and laugh at that. You know, ha ha ha, girls they can't even get things done because they won't stick their hands in the dirt, right, without gardening <laughs> gloves. Um, that's fine. Like, those are okay. 
and uh, uh, that's that's not but today we're adversarial about it we hate each other over it it's um a social it's problem. a mic it's a microaggression <laughs> yeah how dare you be dirty uh, don't you respect women like i'm sorry i just got off work and haven't got home to take a shower yet you know just stopped at the convenience store to pick up a gallon of milk um you know or sorry lady i'm homeless i can't wash off the cigarette smell yeah yeah but uh but yeah um noba fan 21 gave us a rumble rant for a dollar and said if you haven't already can you cover more articles and talks where mom women say holding women accountable is misogyny you know here's the sad part about that right they don't overtly make that statement verbatim what they do is respond to ways in which women are held accountable for making stupid choices or or uh doing bad things to other people that are harmful to them or hurtful to them um by by calling you a misogynist for criticizing their behavior you know for instance um slut shaming oh you're a misogynist you're sl- slut slut shaming uh this girl for cheating on her boyfriend no we're we're criticizing the betrayal like you, a relationship mm-hmm. involves loyalty you know don't don't call women bitches that's uh that's sexist well, don't act like one right you know? I, I i right before i set up the show today i had an argument with a dipshit um which that's that's not unusual like i do that all the time <laughs> on twitter my my whole twitter feed is is uh either it, it's me saying things and then ending up arguing with dipshits over their reaction right and uh that that's you know i pointed out something that i've i've talked about this the the basis you know for for the christian faith is love god with everything and love your neighbor as you love yourself and everything else that you're taught in the christian faith hinges on those two things we know this because Jesus said so. Like that's my belief system. That's that's how I respond to everything. I've talked about tough love and getting gruff and angry with people, and how you know part of that love is you you fall down and you're forgiven, and you it's your job to get back up and try to do better the next time, right? Um, and you're supposed to love everybody. Well, it's easy to love men. Because men do bring respectability to the relationship between the sexes. Men bring loyalty and honor and, uh, you know, they bring compassion, camaraderie, kindness. Um, I guess you could say men are okay, right? But women, a lot of times, women bring nothing. You know, or they bring animosity, um, they bring pain and suffering. It makes it it be, it can be a lot more work to love women and to respond to women's uh, normal, common attitudes and behaviors in a manner that is guided by love, even when you're angry, uh, as opposed to men. Because of that, right? and men make their being about their impact on society. And women make their being about society's impact on them. Mm-hmm. And so, I pointed out, um, you know, his, and historically, women have done better than, than than they than they are doing right now. That's another thing that that people don't understand. But I pointed out, you know, men men deserve to be loved, but right now, women on the whole don't. In response to the question, "What controversial opinion has you like this?" and it's that screenshot. Of the guy with all the swords pointed at him from uh, the movie about the guys looking for El Dorado. I think the movie was called El Dorado, like Disney or something, cartoon. Um, and this chick, uh, knee jerk, reacted, got offended, um, kept calling me bro, of course. <laughs> but she knee jerk reacted, and it was it was um, 
very upsetting for her to hear that. Right? But she didn't react by wanting to find out why I thought that. She only reacted with condemnation, anger, and an adversarial response. And she never did turn away from that. Thereby proving your original... Yeah. Women make themselves very hard to love. Yeah. Right? Mm-hmm. So, and it's sad. Um, like, so that's, I guess, my my answer. Uh, you know, like, it, you, you want to change things for women. Um, women make themselves very hard to love. You can't talk about holding women accountable because you can't even talk about that without a woman I mean, getting upset. Forget about love. I don't, I don't even like a lot of these bitches. <laughs> I, it's, that's come fair. On. <laughs> there's just not very many redeemable qualities in in a large percentage of them and the numbers are just increasing and you know i i think you know women mature at their own speed right you know i i don't know maybe Maybe some of them are seeing what this whole culture is uh, turning into and saying to themselves, you know, I don't want to be like that. Hopefully it's more than, you know, <laughs> the, the paltry number that I'm thinking of in my head. But, uh, you know, why, why would you even want to deal with them? God, they just it is hard. don't bring. I mean, I they, they have nothing to talk about. I swear to God, try having a conversation with them about anything that doesn't directly involve themselves or entertainment or I don't know, you know, fashion, because, um... shit like that. Any... I, I, I consider these conversations a form of... You, you take a disruptor to mm-hmm. the person's um, current uh, attitude, beliefs, suffering, um, personality, flaws, whatever. A disruptor uh, that, that kind of works like the ball in the, the game Breakout. You remember Breakout where you would have to hit the little bricks? Uh, you had the little... Use the uh, little paddle wheel controller for the for the uh, Atari. This was an Atari Twenty Six Hundred game, right? And you have this little um, line across the bottom of the screen that represents your uh, paddle, like a ping pong paddle. And there's a little square on the screen that represents a ball. And it was like pong, except it was you against a wall of pixelated bricks and you would hit the ball the ball would be moving on its own you would direct the paddle to where the ball would impact it and it would bounce off and go in a direction and it would bounce or this yeah commodore 64 had it too yes Mm -hmm. um old school lou uh got it yeah so there are a lot of people that do do remember that right and it didn't just blow up, you know, the the brick wall like a lot of modern games, you know, you throw a bomb and boom, it's done. But it would hit a brick and it would take a brick out. Or on a really high difficulty level, it would hit a brick and it would change the color. And then it would hit it a second time to take it out. Um, and there were different ways you could do, like with uh, the Atari version, if you managed to manipulate it right, you could hold the paddle still and the ball would just bounce straight up and down and go all the way through to the top of the screen. And then it would it would create a new dynamic for how it bounced around. But if you bounce it at an angle, it could bounce off the walls, hit the bricks, bounce off of that, go back to the walls and bounce around. Like if you got it in the top of the screen, above the bricks, it would just go ballistic, bouncing up and down and taking out bricks until it made a bigger space and then it would slow down and everything. Um, so it would bounce around and it would change the environment that it that it was in there, right? That kind of disruptor. It gets it gets you know some things change the way they look, some things disappear, uh, and it and it bounces around in there, but it won't go away. You have to uh, move the paddle out of the way 
or turn the game off to end the game. And uh, that's that's what I'm trying to do with thoughts, right? Get a disruptor like that, an idea, a concept, a question into the other person's mind that is so um, dramatic in the, the effect it has, whether it makes them very happy or very angry, that it becomes a nagging question or a nagging doubt or a nagging uh, sore spot. Like the sore spot you get if you have a toothache where you keep putting your tongue in that spot to feel the tooth, mm-hmm. uh, the fever around the tooth and everything. Um, and that's what's going to happen with the, the thoughts that the the twits that I deal with on Twitter uh, address. They may block, they may, you know, have temper tantrums, they may argue, they may say all kinds of things. But the questions that I raise and the the ideas that I communicate, I don't expect them to ever come back and say, gosh, you were right, I was wrong, or change yeah. their mind in the moment or anything like that. It's yeah. just about making them consider by making the idea, the concept, the question, the criticism too hard to ignore. Mm-hmm. And uh, sometimes you got to piss people off to do that. Yeah. Yeah, and I think it, a lot of this is happening right now um, because everybody is talking about the manosphere and women and, and, you know, male and female relationships. It just seems to be the really big hot topic. Mm-hmm. And I think a lot of people are waking up and, you know, men are men are actually awakening to this thing and i think a lot of men already knew this you know but they just sat there silently like yeah you know all right well if nobody else is gonna say it i'm not gonna stick my neck out you know and now it's just come to the point where this there's like this crescendo you know and um so all all of these hoes who have priced themselves out of the game yeah (laughs) it's going to be a cold winter because men are not putting up with this shit anymore. You know, we, we, they, they are seeing through all of this. Okay. And they're not willing to be your fucking pay pigs anymore. You're going to have to grow a personality and grow the fuck up and deal with the reality of your life and the consequences of the decisions that you made. Yeah. Uh, because it, We're done. We're done. <laughs> I'm done. I don't want to pay for your shit. I don't. I'm, I'm sick. Of, good lord, if I, I can't scream enough about how I'm tired of paying my fucking taxes. My taxes are fucking going to all your fucking bullshit, subsidizing these stupid choices that you make. I, I am done with it. Yeah. Um, well, and it's it's very much. You know, I I think I likened it on Tuesday, and I'll, I'll do it again to cutting off the financing of an addict by a mm-hmm. family member, right? Yes. You love your family member. You yes. don't want your family member to be taken advantage of and forced to use their income to, you know, for this other person's purposes to the detriment of them being able to take care of themselves and pay right. for their needs, right? And you don't want the addict to die in a puddle of their own vomit or mm-hmm. if they're, you know addicted to something non-chemical that's harming them. You don't want them to suffer the consequences of that either, right? You want to make it hard for them to indulge in a way that is damaging to themselves uh, so that the the pathway to not indulging and not self-harming becomes easier than the pathway to indulging and self-harming. And with women... You know, women are indulging in a lack of accountability in a way that hurts everybody, including themselves. Mm -hmm. So if you love both sexes, if you love men, obviously you don't want men to be exploited. You don't want men to be mistreated. You don't want men to be lied to, scammed, defrauded, um, depressed, angry, sad, lonely. You don't want that for men. Right? But you also don't want women to fail in life. If you love mm-hmm. women, you don't want them to stay on the bottom rung of the success ladder in their areas of interest 
because they don't have the accountability to lift themselves up that ladder. Exactly. And, you know, love love is not just being nice and doing nice things for someone. Love is also being crit- critical of them, you know, criticizing them and telling them when they're doing, telling somebody when they're doing the wrong thing. You I know? disagree. <laughs> you, did, <laughs> you see what I did there? You, you, you. <laughs> you know, but um, women are just so accustomed to being told that everything that they want is is the right thing and oh no no, no. it's not your fault it's never your fault but that's well, it, not the case that starts with women telling themselves that too well yeah absolutely you know but you know i was talking but, about this uh, yesterday with peter wright actually so i made a post um at first in response to a conversation that the conversation wasn't going anywhere the two people involved i you know i really wasn't going to take a side in this conversation because it was pointless. Um, but I pointed out in response to criticism of women as a population, uh, that, cause like this conversation was basically, well, all women are like that. Well, no, some women aren't like that. You know, it doesn't matter if some women aren't like that. And it doesn't matter if somebody says all women are like that. Um, if, if you're not like that, he's not talking about you. Right. Right. Um, but in any case, that's 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 the way I feel about it. Like I, when I hear guys, you know, saying all women are liars, I don't take it personally because everybody has been through an ordeal caused by a woman's lie. Mm-hmm. I don't know anybody that hasn't experienced that, right? And it's it, it's bad enough that it's dangerous. So that's a bigger problem than how I feel about him using the word all instead of saying nearly all. It doesn't matter. Yeah. He's not talking about right. me. Right. Um, but I said it is a sad and sad but undeniable truth. And this is this is one one of the roots I think of the accountability gap. By the way, uh, behind everything else in gender issues, there lies a gender gap in personal accountability, both in the individual's grasp of it and the social pressure one faces to demonstrate it. The overwhelming majority of girls start with less natural risk-taking tendency than boys Um, and can't equal their starting point for learning accountability because to be accountable means be willing to endure consequences when you're wrong Uh, they grow up you even sometimes by the way have to endure consequences when you're right Right? you make the right choice I want to buy this dress but I need all of the money that's available to me right now to pay the rent. Right? The consequence of choosing the right thing is that you don't get the dress and you don't have any extra money. Obviously, it's not as bad as the consequence of choosing the wrong thing because you're not facing the consequence that comes with not paying your rent. You're not getting evicted. Your landlord's not mad at you and so on. Right? But girls have a tendency to feel like they shouldn't face consequences when they make decisions, right? They grow up with their their sense of personal accountability being crippled by social norms, which may be in response to the original handicap there, or maybe for other, other reasons, uniquely shield girls and women, almost always at the expense of boys and men, from any adverse consequences of their choices, whether the choice itself was advisable or inadvisable. As a result, the overwhelming majority of women are woefully inept at evaluating their choices in an accountable manner and taking responsibility for their effect on themselves, much less others, in adulthood. Uh, most women reach the level, um, uh, you know, in adulthood, most women reach the level of accountability boys reach at about 14 years old, right before they're expected to start laboring to finance their lifestyle choices and their personal relationship interests, way before they are expected to finance their own living expenses. Many women never mature beyond that point. This is why alimony and child support exist. If all, or even most women, matured beyond that point, they'd be ashamed to break up their committed marriage. And even if they couldn't prevent the breakup, they'd be ashamed to accept those payouts. And when I was talking to Peter Wright about the responses to this post, um, it it occurred to me, you know, it it just hit me. Because 
responses to the post between men and women were kind of different. And I, I will admit, I got a little impatient um, with with women lately because I've been um, lacking sleep <laughs> lately. Uh, you know, like I uh, been dealing with some medical issues. So, but I but I pointed out. Um, that probably, that risk aversion is probably the underlying, the main underlying fuel for the, the accountability gap. Um, mm. I think, like, there's, there's a lot of social things that have broadened, widened, fueled, you know, whatever the accountability gap. There's a lot of things that we've done. Coverture, for instance, was kind of men's reaction to women's lack of accountability, and they reacted by taking more responsibility, and um, as a result of that responsibility, they had restrictions and obligations that women had to, to deal with in order to facilitate men meeting those responsibilities. That's fine. If you're not going to be accountable, we'll be accountable, but you have to get out of our way. Stop hindering our accountability. Right? That's, mm -hmm. that's that. Uh, oh, that's what I just I just found out, guys. What has been slowing down my computer this whole fucking time? Oh God! Uh, my Google account, <laughs> like my little icon for my Google account, right next to my icon, it usually you know tells whether I'm signed in or not. Now it says finish update. Fuckers! <laughs> oh, you're using the computer now to do things? Yes, it's been on for three hours, but we're gonna do the update right now. Fucking Google. Um, okay. I'm going to have to start using Brave on that computer, too. Well, Brave does the same damn thing. But, yeah. Does it? Um, I, I pointed out, for instance, in, in the discussion... Um, yeah, where where is it? I'm I'm like actually going through it right now. Like coverture doctrine was probably based on the accountability gap and what I just described. Um... And there was probably originally that small gap, you know, even even before coverture, even before um, all the legal changes and everything, there was that small gap because women have a tendency. The thing that I remember pointing out, I don't, I don't need to remember how I, I um, worded it, but because women are more risk averse than men. And because they have a natural tendency to be more skittish about risk and to be a little more neurotic about consequences, women have a tendency to gloss things over in their mind. Um, they will convince themselves that their actions, um, if they do the right thing, that it, there shouldn't be any consequences for it. That should fix everything. Like, you do something... Um, ethical or moral or wise that should eliminate whatever adversity you might face as a result. When in fact, uh, you can make very advantageous purchases or uh, moral choices, ethical choices and so on, there are still consequences. Right? When you cut off the funding for the addict's addiction, the addict is going to be angry with you. That is a consequence. The addict might even hate you for a while. Might even hate you for 20 years. Um, but uh, whatever good comes out of it, you know, them getting that opportunity to say, well, all right, I'm going to try to rehabilitate so that I don't suffer because of this. Because um, I don't feel like I have a choice. Well, you, you know, they still have a choice. You know, If they do that... It's worth it. It's worth them being angry. You have to decide that kind of thing, right? When you pay your rent instead of buying the thing you wanted, it's worth it because now you're not going to be homeless next month. And so women, men make themselves comfortable with taking on consequences like that. Um, women pretend they don't exist. Mm -hmm. right? Women's part of women's risk aversion manifests in convincing themselves that um, the right thing will have fewer consequences, and then women turn around and demand society make that true. Yeah. So, for instance, if a woman looks at a situation, she doesn't think about um, 
risking conception as a uh, uh, unwise choice. She doesn't think about um, risking conception when um, when she's with a guy that she doesn't plan on staying with, doesn't plan on marrying, isn't going to raise a child with him, you know, that kind of thing. She doesn't think of that necessarily as a wrong choice, but she recognizes killing the baby as a wrong choice, for instance. She says, okay, that's murder, I'm not going to do that. Right. Well, then she's going to look at the financial consequences as something that's inflicted on her by society, not a natural consequence of taking on the responsibility of raising a child. But she'll look at the pain and suffering that she might go through if she parts with that child so that the child can be raised by somebody that's better financially set and has a more stable environment to provide love and nurturing for the child. Like, that's something that society inflicted on her, too. And uh, she's not going to look at it as a natural consequence and something that she should have to be prepared to, you know, weather and acclimate herself to, endure, uh, process, suck it up, and drive on from. Mm -hmm. So that's the, like, if you look at the accountability gap and you go, all right, what's underneath? What's the the cause of the accountability gap? Like, I'm, I'm not sure that we've identified everything, but on that list, and I would say probably pretty high up on that list, is that risk aversion and that psychological trick women play on themselves in order to be comfortable making decisions in a world in which they are overly risk averse. If that makes sense. Yeah. So. Absolutely. And, and that, that sort of dovetails back into this situation where the woman in this um, video that we just watched was afraid to connect with her child in a meaningful way. Right? She handled him like a problem instead of a person. Mm-hmm. And she didn't want to risk um, teaching him the wrong thing, so she tried not to teach him anything. Right. She didn't want to risk right. being wrong about stuff, so she was authoritarian. And she didn't want to risk him mimicking behaviors that she thought was dysfunctional or increasing his temper. So she tried to present, pretend she didn't have one, and she didn't teach mm -hmm. him how to handle it. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And, and then when the child had a poor outcome from those um, risk-averse behaviors of hers, she rewrote things in her mind that it was somebody else's fault. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, women think accountability is a mathematical skill. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and, and as we all know, math, math is hard. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. So there you go. Um, I don't have any other super chats. Uh, let me see. I don't have any other super chows. And let's look at. I lost Rumble. There it is. Okay. Uh, don't have any other rumble rants. So that's it. So uh, I think we're going to call it. It's 10 after 9. That's not too bad. Uh, about an hour and a half. Not too bad. Took us an hour and a half to go through six minutes and then talk about it. <laughs> that's, that's badger time. <laughs> that, exactly. That is standard. So, Thanks for uh, sticking out this odd um, discussion, long video, uh, sort of 26 minute video total, right? Uh, thanks everybody for listening, and uh, especially to all of the story time with Hannah part, parts of it, because I can't look at somebody else's parenting and childhood without thinking about my own um, yeah. comparing, you know, that's sort of how I explain things. And uh, thanks to everybody who works in the background to make HBR talk happen. Good night, all. Good night, y'all. Men's Good right night. activists are machines.
dude, okay? They are literal machines. They are talking point machines. They are impossible to fucking deal with, especially if you have like, especially if you have like a, a couple dudes who have good memory on top of that too. Holy shit, you're fucked.